Greetings, I'm the dentist. Welcome back to Dent Agenda. This is the beginning of a new video series in which we will discuss pediatric dentistry. These are the points included in this chapter video series and in this tutorial we will discuss the following topics. Starting with the child patient. Principal aims of treatment are development and maintenance of healthy, functional and aesthetic primary and secondary dentitions, freedom from pain and infection, a happy and cooperative patient if possible, and do not forget prevention is priority. With children, always remember, praise good behaviour reinforcement techniques for behaviour management and ignore bad acts. Involve the parents. They determine whether the child will return or not. Do not offer choices where there are none. Avoid rhetorical questions like, would you like to sit on my chair? Because obviously the child may say no. Children have short attention spans that increases with age and they have decreased sensory acuity, so they may confuse pressure with pain, so sensibility tests are less reliable. Children have decreased manual dexterity, therefore they may need help with toothbrushing when they are younger than seven years of age. Formulate a comprehensive treatment plan, which should address both operative and preventive care. Start with simple procedures, like oral hygiene instructions and progress at child's base to more complicated treatments. Set attainable targets for each visit and try to attain them. Here are some points to keep in mind in the first visit for the child. Children should first visit a dentist as soon as they have teeth, which is about six months of age. For young children, watching other members of the family receive a checkup prior to their turn may be preferable, which is the modeling technique. For infants and very young children, a full dental examination is not essential if compliance is an issue. The emphasis should be on acclimatization, delivering age-appropriate prevention advice and establishing rapport and a positive trusting professional relationship with the family. Confirm who is with the child and who has parental responsibility. Check medical history and reasons for attendance. Talk to the child. Communication is the key to success. Show the patient the chair, mirror and light and explain this purpose. Tell, show and do techniques for behaviour management. Count the patient's teeth. If good progress, apply fluoride varnish if appropriate or polish a few teeth if indicated, but do not tire the child by attempting too much in the first visit. Show the parent the children's teeth and what has been done that visit. Deal with the patient's complaint. If the child is in pain, the source of this need to be determined and dealt with as quickly as possible. Younger children can sometimes be more successfully examined using knee-to-knee -knee examination technique. The parent and the dentist should sit facing each other with their knees touching. The child should be seated on the parent's lap with the child facing them. The parent then lowers the child back onto the dentist's lap. Moving to treatment planning for children. Starting with diagnosis, dental caries is often a rapidly progressing condition in children. It is essential to secure an accurate diagnosis before making a treatment plan. This is achieved by taking a history, doing an examination, and where appropriate, taking bite wing radiographs. Two bite wings are important for an accurate diagnosis unless a proximal surface caries of primary molars can be visualized, since the dentition is usually spaced. Treatment plan. 
The ultimate aim in dentistry for children is for the child to reach adulthood with good dental status and a positive attitude towards dental health and dental treatment. The final treatment plan will take into account the following considerations behavior management, prevention, and restorative treatments. Remember to consider the developing occlusion, long-term prognosis of first permanent molars. You can extract the poor quality first permanent molars. Pulpate for the canines at the age of 9 to 10 years to discover palatally displaced maxillary canines. Beware disturbances in eruption sequence, failure or delayed eruption or asymmetry. Early referral to a specialist for skeletal discrepancies and for any significant abnormal findings. Other considerations. Pain or evidence of infection may influence the order of the treatment plan. Temporization using hand excavation and dressing of open cavities at the start of the treatment gives a good introduction to dentistry, helps to minimize the risk of pain before treatment is completed, improves comfort during brushing and eating, reducing salivary streptococcus mutants count, produces a preliminary coronal seal, enhancing the chances of pulpal recovery and survival. It may provide slow release of fluoride in the short term if a glass ionomer cement is used. The treatment plan is drawn up visit by visit. Each visit has both preventive and operative components, optimally aiming to deliver only one key preventive message per visit. As it is considered to be easier to administer local anesthesia for maxillary teeth, these teeth are usually treated before mandibular ones. Restorative care by repairing teeth without prevention is of a limited value. Dental caries is treated by preventive measures. Restoration primarily repairs the damage caused by caries process. In many circumstances, children with caries in primary molars may be treated by prevention alone if oral hygiene is good. Care delivery. Once the treatment needs have been decided upon, be aware that the treatment plan will change and evolve depending on various factors. Discuss with parent and patient the treatment options. Local anesthesia, sedation or general anesthesia. Consider and discuss the risks versus the benefits of each. Plan operative care at a pace appropriate to the child's ability to cope. Be prepared to reconsider method of delivery of care if the patient proves unable to accept the treatment using original delivery strategy. Where necessary, consider referral to an appropriate service which can provide sedation or general anesthesia. Look out for any signs of underlying medical or social problems which may modify the treatment plan, like systemic diseases, failure to thrive, evidence of abuse or neglect, small stature and other family circumstances which might affect the care, such as home distance and other family or work caring commitments. Now let's talk about how to deal with anxious child. Techniques for behavior management. While many of these techniques often come with the experience of treating children, over a period of time, they can still be learned. General principles. Show interest in the child as a person. Child notices dentist's behavior in the following order. Touch, facial expression, tone of the voice and then what is being said. Do not ignore a child fears or anxieties. Explain why, how and when. Aim to reward behavior which approximates to positive and try to ignore inappropriate or negative behaviors. Get the child involved in the treatment like holding the saliva ejector himself. Giving the child some control over the situation will also help them to relax like giving you a stop signal, such as raising the hand, if they want you to stop for any reason. The aim is to familiarize or adapt the child to the new experiences associated with the dental care and establish a positive, trusting relationship with the child and the family.
Here are some useful techniques that may help you successfully deliver the care for the children. Reinforcement. This is the strengthening of patterns of behavior, usually by rewarding good behavior with approval and praise. If a child protests and is uncooperative during the treatment, do not immediately abandon the session and return them to the consolation of the parents, as this could inadvertently reinforce the undesirable behavior. Try to ensure that something is completed, like placing a dressing or even an examination, and focus on the successful completion of this task, rather than the failure to complete what might have been originally planned. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy A goal-oriented therapy which aims to help the child manage their anxiety by changing how they think and behave in relation to their problems. This can be used with assistance from psychologists and chair-side self-help methods. Desensitization It means to diminish emotional responsiveness to a negative, aversive or positive stimulus after repeated exposure to it. Used for a child with pre-existing fears or phobias, involves helping the patient to relax in the dental environment, then constructing a hierarchy of steps which gradually approximate to the fear-provoking stimulus for the patient. These steps are then introduced to the child gradually, with progression onto the next stimulus only when the child is able to cope with the previous situation. It is useful in approaching and managing needle phobias. Tell, show and do. Self-explanatory, but use language the child will understand. Behaviour shaping aim to guide and modify the child's responses, selectively reinforcing appropriate behaviour while discouraging or ignoring inappropriate behaviours. And finally, modeling, useful for children with little previous dental experience who are apprehensive. Encourage the child to watch other children of similar age or siblings receiving dental treatment happily. Watching a model on a video can also be helpful. Now to the question, should a parent accompany the child into surgery? Well, this is essential on the first visit and thereafter depends upon the child's age and the clinician's preferences. If in doubt, ask about the child's preference. However, if the parent is dental phobic, their anxiety in the dental environment can be detrimental. So in these cases, it is worth considering leaving the parent in the waiting room. Younger children are more likely to suffer separation and anxiety and many parents nowadays wish to be involved in and informed about the child's treatment. In the event of anxiety-related behaviour being encountered, a parental presence in the surgery room does enable consent for any adjustment in the treatment to be easily maintained. Ideally, parents should be motivated positively and instructed to act in the role of a silent helper. A parent's guide can be downloaded by parents to promote positive language and behaviour even before coming to the dentist for treatment. Now let's discuss the routes through which you can deliver a sedative medication. Number 1. Intravenous. It is not commonly used in children younger than 12 years of age, and if to be used, it is considered to be an advanced technique and should only be administered by staff specially trained and experienced and in a clinical environment suited for this technique. Number 2. Oral drugs. Specialized knowledge and skills are required to determine their use. Number three, sedation. Sometimes indicated for the genuinely anxious child who wishes to cooperate and also may help children with overactive gag reflex and those for whom analgesia in addition to local anesthesia may be needed, like in case of difficult extraction of sexes. Intramuscular. Rarely used in children. Perrectum in the form of suppository. It is popular in some countries. Other options include intranasal sedation, acupuncture and even acupressure. It helps patients with particularly severe gag reflex. And finally, inhalation. 
uses nitrous oxide oxygen mixture to produce relative analgesia and is the most popular technique for use with children. It is effective to decrease anxiety and increase tolerance of invasive procedure in children who wish to cooperate but are too anxious to do so without help. Let the child position the nose piece themselves. Hypnosis produces a state of altered consciousness and relaxation, though it cannot be used to make subjects do anything that they don't wish to do. Appropriate training is necessary for those wishing to practice hypnosis. It can be described as either a way of helping the child to relax or as a special kind of sleep. General anesthesia allows dental rehabilitation and or dental extractions to be achieved at one visit. General anesthesia should only be used for dental treatment when absolutely necessary, like when other methods of management or local anesthesia and sedation are deemed unsuitable. Alternative strategies and the risks of general anesthesia must be discussed to enable parents to make an informed decision. The risk of unexpected death of a healthy person under general anesthesia has been estimated to about 3 or 4 in 1 million. Under sedation has been estimated to about 1 in 2 millions. Other behaviour problems and their management. Some children attempt to delay treatment by a parage of questions. This is usually a sign of anxiety, and firm but gentle handling is needed. Tell the patient that you understand their anxieties and that you will explain as you go along. The temper tantrum try to establish communication with the child. Praise good and ignore bad behaviours. Set an easily achievable goal, like brushing teeth, and make sure it is achieved. Comment on the positive outcome rather than what was not achieved. Last but not least, the child with toothache. When faced with a child with toothache, pulpal or periodontal pathology are the commonest causes. The dentist has to use clinical acumen to try and determine the state of the affected tooth or teeth as this will decide the treatment required. To that end, the following investigations may be used. The first step is always history taking. Take a pain history from the child and parent. Beware of variation in accuracy. Anxious children may deny being in pain when faced with an eager dentist. Whereas parents who feel guilty for delaying seeking dental treatment may aggregate the pain. Remember, some pathologies are painless, like chronic periradicular periodontitis. Include medical history and confirm who the child has attended with. Secondly, examination. Check for swelling, temperature, or lymphadenopathy. Have an intraoral look for caries, abscess chronic buccal sinuses or mobile teeth that could be due to exfoliation or apical infection and erupting teeth as well. Color change may indicate a history of trauma and loss of vitality. Percussion. It can be unreliable in children as we mentioned before. Use gentle finger pressure first. Care is needed to establish a consistent response and compare with unaffected control teeth. Consider the tone of the percussion note, as ankylosed tooth will have more of a solid sound when tapped compared to the dull cushion sound of other sound teeth. Sensibility testing. Using thermal like ethyl chloride or cotton wool or electrical stimulation. Reliable responses on a control tooth before testing the tooth or teeth in question. Check for false positive by alternating the intensity of stimulus. 
Use a cotton ball with ethyl chloride followed by a dry cotton ball. Less reliable in primary teeth due to root resorption. Radiographs. Biotwing x-rays may be useful. Not only are they less uncomfortable for small mouths than periapicals, but they also often show the affrication area where radiolucency secondary to periodontitis is often first apparent. An upper standard occlusal radiograph may be helpful alternative to periapicals for anterior painful teeth or impacted canines. Now, after doing all those examinations, what should diagnosis be? Fleeting or transient pain on hot, cold and sweet stimuli indicates reversible pulpitis. Longer lasting or persistent pain on hot, cold and sweet stimuli or spontaneous pain with no initiating factors that can keep the child awake at night but there is no mobility and the teeth are not tender to percussion, indicates irreversible pulpitis. Pain on biting and pressure, and if there is swelling and tenderness of adjacent tissues, or tooth mobility, indicates acute periradicular periodontitis. The suggested treatments for each of these cases will be discussed in upcoming videos in this chapter. And remember, the only 100% accurate diagnostic method is histological. Other common potential causes of tooth thick include dental alveolar trauma, mucosal ulceration, teething, and mobility prior to exfoliation of primary teeth. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I'd like to have you here for more videos and follow us on Instagram at Dentagenda for extra tips and tricks.